Disc six. The inspector had finished his tea and sighed and gone, and Poirot had got out his jigsaw puzzle to alleviate his mounting exasperation. For he was exasperated, both exasperated and humiliated. Mrs. Oliver had summoned him, Hercule Poirot, to elucidate a mystery. She had felt that there was something wrong, and there had been something wrong, and she had looked confidently to Hercule Poirot first to prevent it, and he had not prevented it, and secondly to discover the killer, and he had not discovered the killer. He was in a fog, in the type of fog where there are from time to time baffling gleams of light. Every now and then. Or so it seemed to him. He had had one of those glimpses, and each time he had failed to penetrate farther. He had failed to assess the value of what he seemed, for one brief moment, to have seen. Poirot got up, crossed to the other side of the hearth, rearranged the second square chair so that it was at a definite geometric angle, and sat down in it. He had passed from the jigsaw of painted wood and cardboard to the jigsaw of a murdered problem. He took a notebook from his pocket and wrote in small, neat characters: Etienne de Souza, Amanda Bruis, Alec Leg, Sally Leg, Michael Wayman. It was physically impossible for Sir George or Jim Warburton to have killed Marlene Tucker. Since it was not physically impossible for Mrs. Oliver to have done so, he added her name after a brief space. He also added the name of Mrs. Masterton. Since he did not remember, of his own knowledge, having seen Mrs. Masterton constantly on the lawn between four o'clock and quarter to five, he added the name of Hendon, the butler, more perhaps because a sinister butler had figured in Mrs. Oliver's murder hunt than because he had really any suspicions of the dark-haired artist with the gong stick. He also put down boy in turtle shirt with a query mark after it. Then, he smiled, shook his head. Took a pin from the lapel of his jacket, shut his eyes, and stabbed with it. It was as good a way as any, he thought. He was justifiably annoyed when the pin proved to have transfixed the last entry. Oh, I am an imbecile," said Hercule Poirot. "What has a boy in a turtle shirt to do with this?、Uh? But he also realised he must have had some reason for including this enigmatic character in his list. He recalled again the day he had sat in the folly, and the surprise on the boy's face at seeing him there. Not a very pleasant face, despite the youthful good looks. An arrogant, ruthless face. The young man had come there for some purpose. He had come to meet someone, and it followed that that someone was a person whom he could not meet or did not wish to meet in the ordinary way. It was a meeting, in fact, to which attention must not be called. A guilty meeting. Something to do with the murder. Poirot pursued his reflections. A boy who was staying at the youth hostel—that is to say, a boy who would be in that neighbourhood for two nights at most—had he come there casually, one of the many young students visiting Britain, or had he come there for a special purpose to meet some special person? There could have been what seemed a casual encounter. On the day of the fate, possibly there had been.、Mm, I know a good deal," said Hercule Poirot to himself. "I have in my hands many, many pieces of this jigsaw. I have an idea of the kind of crime it was, but it must be that I am not looking at it the right way." He turned a page of his notebook and wrote, "Did Lady Stubbs ask Miss Brewis to take tea to Marlene? If not, why?" Does Miss Brewis say that she did? He considered the point. Miss Brewis might quite easily herself have thought of taking cake and a fruit drink to the girl, but if so, why did she not simply say so? Why lie about Lady Stubbs having asked her to do so? Could this be because Miss Brewis went to the boat house and found Marlene dead? Unless Miss Brewis was herself guilty of the murder, that seemed very unlikely. She was not a nervous woman nor an imaginative one. If she had found the girl dead, she would surely at once have given the alarm. He stared for some time at the two questions he had written. 
he could not help feeling that somewhere in those words there was some vital pointer to the truth that had escaped him. After four or five minutes of thought, he wrote down something more. Etienne de Souza declares that he wrote to his cousin three weeks before his arrival at Nas House. Is that statement true or false? Poirot felt almost certain that it was false. He recalled the scene at the breakfast table. There seemed no earthly reason why Sir George or Lady Stubbs should pretend to a surprise, and in the latter's case, a dismay, which they did not feel. He could see no purpose to be accomplished by it. Granting, however, that Etienne de Souza had lied, why did he lie? To give the impression that his visit had been announced and welcomed? It might be so, but it seemed a very doubtful reason. There was certainly no evidence that such a letter had ever been written or received. Was it an attempt on de Souza's part to establish his bona fides, to make his visit appear natural and even expected? Certainly, Sir George had received him amicably enough, although he did not know him. Poirot paused, his thoughts coming to a stop. Sir George did not know de Souza. His wife, who did know him, had not seen him. Was there perhaps something there? Could it be possible that the Etienne de Souza? Who had arrived that day at the fete was not the real Etienne de Souza. He went over the idea in his mind, but again he could see no point to it. What had de Souza to gain by coming and representing himself as de Souza if he was not de Souza? In any case, de Souza did not derive any benefit from Hattie's death. Hattie, as the police had ascertained, had no money of her own except that which was allowed her by her husband. Poirot tried to remember exactly what she had said to him that morning. He is a bad man; he does wicked things, and according to Bland, she had said to her husband, "He kills people." There was something rather significant about that. Now that one came to examine all the facts, he kills people. On the day Etienne de Souza had come to Nas House, one person certainly had been killed, possibly two people. Mrs. Folliot had said that one should pay no attention to these melodramatic remarks of Hattie's. She had said so very insistently.、Hmm. Mrs. Folliot. Hercule Poirot frowned, then brought his hand down with a bang on the arm of his chair. Always, always I return to Mrs. Folliot. She is the key to the whole business. If I knew what she knows, oh, I can no longer sit in an armchair and just think. No, I must take a train and go again to Devon and visit Mrs. Folliot. Hercule Poirot paused for a moment outside the big wrought iron gates of Nas House. He looked ahead of him along the curving drive. It was no longer summer. Golden brown leaves fluttered gently down from the trees. Near at hand, the grassy banks were coloured with small mauve cyclamen. Poirot sighed. The beauty of Nas House appealed to him in spite of himself. He was not a great admirer of nature in the wild. He liked things trim and neat. Yet he could not but appreciate the soft wild beauty of massed shrubs and trees. At his left was the small white porticoed lodge. It was a fine afternoon. Probably Mrs. Folliot would not be at home. She would be out somewhere with her gardening basket, or else visiting some friends in the neighbourhood. She had many friends. This was her home, and had been her home for many long years. What was it the old man on the quay had said? There'll always be Folliots at Nas House. Poirot rapped gently upon the door of the lodge. After a few moments' delay, he heard footsteps inside. They sounded to his ear slow and almost hesitant. Then the door was opened, and Mrs. Folliot stood framed in the doorway. He was startled to see how old and frail she looked. She stared at him incredulously for a moment or two, and then she said, 
Monsieur Poirot, you! He thought for a moment that he had seen fear leap into her eyes, but perhaps that was sheer imagination on his part. He said politely, "May I come in, Madame?" Oh, but of course. She had recovered all her poise now, beckoned him in with a gesture, and led the way into her small sitting room. There were some delicate Chelsea figures on the mantelpiece, a couple of chairs covered in exquisite petit point, and a Derby tea service stood on the small table. Mrs. Folliot said, "I will fetch another cup." Poirot raised a faintly protesting hand, but she pushed the protest aside. Of course, you must have some tea. She went out of the room. He looked around him once more. A piece of needlework, a pity point chair seat, lay on a table with a needle sticking into it. Against the wall was a bookcase with books. There was a little cluster of miniatures on the wall and a faded photograph in a silver frame of a man in uniform with a stiff moustache and a weak chin. Mrs. Folliot came back into the room with a cup and saucer in her hand. Poirot said, "Your husband, Madame?" "Yes." Noticing that Poirot's eyes swept along the top of the bookcase as though in search of further photographs, she said brusquely, "I'm not fond of photographs. They make one live in the past too much. One must learn to forget. One must cut away the dead wood." Poirot remembered how the first time he had seen Mrs. Folliot, she had been clipping with secateurs at a shrub on the bank. She had said then, he remembered, something about dead wood. He looked at her thoughtfully, appraising her character. An enigmatical woman, he thought, and a woman who, in spite of the gentleness and fragility of her appearance, had a side to her that could be ruthless. A woman who could cut away dead wood, not only from plants. But from her own life, she sat down and poured out a cup of tea, asking, "Milk, sugar,、uh, three lumps, if you will be so good, Madame." She handed him his cup and said conversationally, "I was surprised to see you. Somehow, I did not imagine you would be passing through this part of the world again." "I am not exactly passing through," said Poirot. "No," she queried him with slightly uplifted eyebrows. No, my visit to this part of the world is intentional.、Hmm. She still looked at him in inquiry. I came here partly to see you, Madame. Really? Well, first of all, there has been no news of the young lady Stubbs. Mrs. Folliot shook her head. There was a body washed up the other day in Cornwall. She said George went there to see if he could identify it, but it was not her. She added. I'm very sorry for George. The strain has been very great. Does he still believe that his wife may be alive? Slowly, Mrs. Folliot shook her head. I think, she said, that he has given up hope. And after all, if Hattie were alive, she couldn't possibly conceal herself successfully with the whole of the press and the police looking for her. Even if something like loss of memory had happened to her, well. Surely the police would have found her by now. It would seem so, yes," said Poirot. "Do the police still search?" "I suppose so. I, I do not really know." "But Sir George has given up hope." "Well, he doesn't say so," said Mrs. Folliot. "Of course, I've not seen him lately. He's been mostly in London." "And the murdered girl? There have been no developments there." Not that I know of," she added. "It seems a senseless crime, absolutely pointless. Poor child. It still upsets you, I see, to think of her, Madame." Mrs. Folliot did not reply for a moment or two. Then she said, "I think when one is old, the death of anyone who is young upsets one out of due proportion. We old folks expect to die." But that child had a life before her. Ah,、oh, but it might not have been a very interesting life. Not from our point of view, perhaps, but it might have been interesting to her. And also, as you say, we old folk must expect to die," said Poirot. "We do not really want to. At least, I do not want to. I find life very interesting still. 
I don't think that I do. She spoke more to herself than him. Her shoulders drooped still more. I am very tired, Monsieur Poirot. I shall be not only ready, but thankful when my time comes. He shot a quick glance at her. He wondered, as he had wondered before, whether it was a sick woman who sat talking to him, a woman who had perhaps the knowledge or even the certainty of approaching death. He could not otherwise account for the intense weariness and lassitude of her manner. That lassitude, he felt, was not really characteristic of the woman. Amy Folliot, he felt, was a woman of character, energy, and determination. She had lived through many troubles: loss of her home, loss of wealth, the deaths of her sons. All these, he felt, she had survived. She had cut away the dead wood. As she herself had expressed it, but there was something now in her life that she could not cut away, that no one could cut away for her. If it was not physical illness, he did not see what it could be. She gave a sudden little smile as though she were reading his thoughts. Really, you know, <laughs> I have not very much to live for, Monsieur Poirot," she said. "I have many friends, but..." No near relations, no family. But you have your home," said Poirot on an impulse. "You mean Nas? Oh yes. But it is your home, isn't it? Although technically it is the property of Sir George Stubbs. Now Sir George Stubbs has gone to London. You rule in his stead. Again, he saw the sharp look of fear in her eyes. When she spoke, her voice held an icy edge to it. I don't quite know what you mean, Monsieur Poirot. I am grateful to Sir George for renting me this lodge, but I do rent it. I pay him a yearly sum for it, with the right to walk in the grounds. Poirot spread out his hands. Oh, I apologize, Madame. I did not mean to offend you. Well, no doubt I misunderstood you," said Mrs. Folliot coldly. Oh, it's a beautiful place," said Poirot. "A beautiful house, beautiful grounds. It has about it a great peace, great serenity." Yes," her face lightened. "We have always felt that. I felt it as a child when I first came here. But is there the same peace and serenity now, Madame? Why not? Murder unavenged," said Poirot. The spilling of innocent blood, until that shadow lifts, there will not be peace," he added. "I think you know that, Madame, as well as I do." Mrs. Folliot did not answer. She neither moved nor spoke. She sat quite still, and Poirot had no idea what she was thinking. He leaned forward a little and spoke again. "Madame, you know a good deal, perhaps everything." About this murder, you know who killed that girl. You know why. You know who killed Hattie Stubbs. You know perhaps where her body lies now. Mrs. Folliot spoke. Then her voice was loud, almost harsh. I know nothing," she said. "Nothing. Perhaps I have used the wrong word." You do not know, but I think you guess, Madame. I'm quite sure that you guess. Now you are being, excuse me, absurd. It is not absurd. It is something quite different. It is dangerous. Dangerous to whom? To you, Madame. So long as you keep your knowledge to yourself, you are in danger. I know murderers better than you do, Madame. I have told you already. I have no knowledge. Suspicions, then. I have no suspicions. That, excuse me, is not true, Madame. Look, to speak out of me a suspicion would be wrong. Indeed, wicked. Poirot leaned forward, as wicked as what was done here just over a month ago. She shrank back into her chair, huddled into herself. She half whispered, "Don't talk to me of it," and then added with a long shuddering sigh, "Anyway, it's over now. Done, finished with." How? Can you tell that, Madame? I tell you of my own knowledge that it is never finished with a murderer. She shook her head. No, 
No, it's the end. And anyway, there is nothing I can do. Nothing. He got up and stood looking down at her. She said almost fretfully, Why? Even the police have given up. Poirot shook his head. Oh, no, madame. You are wrong there. The police do not give up. And I, he added, do not give up either. Remember that, madame. I, Hercule Poirot, do not give up. It was a very typical exit line. Chapter 17 After leaving Nass, Poirot went to the village where, by inquiry, he found the cottage occupied by the Tuckers. His knock at the door went unanswered for some moments as it was drowned by the high-pitched tone of Mrs. Tucker's voice from inside. And what be you thinking of, Jim Tucker, bringing them boots of yours onto my nice linonium? If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, been polishing all morning, I have, and now look at it. A faint rumbling denoted Mr. Tucker's reaction to these remarks. It was, on the whole, a placatory rumble. Well, you've no cause to go forgetting. Tis all this eagerness to get the sports news on the wireless. Why, it wouldn't have took you two minutes to be off of them boots. And you, Gary, do you mind what you're doing with that lollipop? Sticky fingers I will not have on my best silver teapot. And Marilyn, that be someone at the door, that be. Do we go and see who it is? The door was opened gingerly, and a child of about eleven or twelve years old peered out suspiciously at Poirot. One cheek was bulged with a sweet. She was a fat child, with small blue eyes and a rather piggy kind of prettiness. "'Tis a gentleman, ma'am," she shouted. Mrs. Tucker, wisps of hair hanging over her somewhat hot face, came to the door. "'My what is it?' she demanded sharply. "'We don't need it!' She paused. A faint look of recognition came across her face. "'Why? Oh, let me see now. Didn't I see you with the police that day?' Alas, madame, that I have brought back painful memories, said Poirot, stepping firmly inside the door. Mrs. Tucker cast a swift, agonized glance at his feet, but Poirot's pointed patent leather shoes had only trodden the high road. No mud was being deposited on Mrs. Tucker's brightly polished linoleum. Oh, well, uh, come in, won't you, sir? <laughs> she said, backing before him and throwing open the door of a room on her right hand. Poirot was ushered into a devastatingly neat little parlour. It smelt of furniture polish and brasso, and contained a large Jacobean suite, a round table, two potted geraniums, an elaborate brass fender, and a large variety of china ornaments. Now, oh, sit down, sir, do. <laughs> I, I can't remember the name. I indeed, I don't think as I ever heard it. Ah, my name is Hercule Poirot said Poirot rapidly. I found myself once more in this part of the world, and I called here to offer you my condolences and to ask you if there had been any developments. I trust the murderer of your daughter has been discovered. Well, well not say the sound of him, said Mrs. Tucker, speaking with some bitterness. And tis a downright wicked shame, if you ask me. It is my opinion the police don't disturb themselves when it's only the likes of us. Anyway, what's the police anyway? If they're more like Bob Askins, I wonder the whole country is in a mass of crime. All that Bob Askins does is spend his time looking into parked cars in the common. At this point, Mr. Tucker, his boots removed, appeared through the doorway walking on his stockinged feet. He was a large, red-faced man with a pacific expression. Well, please be all right, he said in a husky voice. Who got their troubles like anyone else. The zeer maniacs aren't so easy to find. Look the same as you or me, if you take my meaning he added, speaking directly to Poirot. The little girl who had opened the door to Poirot appeared behind her father, and a boy of about eight poked his head round her shoulder. They all stared at Poirot with intense interest. Uh, this is your younger daughter, I suppose, said Poirot. Uh, that's Marilyn, that is, said Mrs. Tucker, and that's Gary. Now, come and say how do you do, Gary, and, and mind your manners. Gary backed away. <laughs> Shy like he is said his mother. Well, it's very civil of you, I'm sure, sir, said Mr. Tucker, to come and ask about Marlene. Uh, that was a terrible business, to be sure. Oh, I have just called upon Mrs. Folliette, said Monsieur Poirot. 
She too seems to feel this very deeply. Well, she's been poorly like ever since," said Mrs. Tucker. "She's an old lady, and 'twas a shock to her, happening as it did in her own place." Poirot noted once more everybody's unconscious assumption that Nas's house still belonged to Mrs. Folliot. "That makes her feel responsible, like in a way," said Mr. Tucker. "Not that 'twas anything to do with her." Who was it that actually suggested that Maline should play the victim? Asked Poirot. Ah,、uh, but the lady from London that writes the books said Mrs. Tucker promptly. Poirot said mildly, "But she was a stranger down here. She did not even know Maline." "Twas Mrs. Masterton what rounded the girls up," said Mrs. Tucker, "and I suppose twas Mrs. Masterton said Marlene was to do it. And Marlene, I must say, was pleased enough at the idea." Once again, Poirot felt. He came up against a blank wall, but he knew now what Mrs. Oliver had felt when she first sent for him. Someone had been working in the dark, someone who had pushed forward their own desires through other recognised personalities. Mrs. Oliver, Mrs. Masterton,、mm. those were the figureheads. He said, "I have been wondering, Mrs. Tucker." Whether Marlene was already acquainted with this、uh, homicidal maniac? Well, she wouldn't know nobody like that," said Mrs. Tucker virtuously. "Ah," said Poirot. "But as your husband has just observed, these maniacs are very difficult to spot. They look the same as、uh, <laughs> you or me. Someone may have spoken to Marlene at the fete or even before it, made friends with her in a perfectly harmless manner, given her presents, perhaps." Oh no, sir! Nothing of that kind. Marlene wouldn't take presents from a stranger. I brought her up better than that. But she might see no harm in it," said Poirot, persisting. Supposing it had been some nice lady who had offered her things, eh?、Huh? Someone you mean like what? Young Mrs. Legg down at the mill cottage? Yes," said Poirot. Someone like that. Ah,、oh, well, give Marlene a lipstick once she did," said Mrs. Tucker. Oh, ever so mad I was! I won't have you putting that muck on your face, Marlene. I said, "Think what your father would say." Wow,、well, she says, perky as may be. Tis the lady down at Laura's cottage to give it me. Said as how it would suit me. She did. Well, I said, don't you listen to what no London ladies say. It's all very well for them, painting their faces and blacking their eyelashes and everything else. But you're a decent girl, I said, and you wash your face with soap and water until you're a good deal older than what you are now. But、uh, she did not agree with you, I expect," <laughs> said Poirot, smiling. "Well, when I say a thing, I mean it," said Mrs. Tucker. The fat Marilyn suddenly gave an amused giggle. Poirot shot her a keen glance. "Did Mrs. Legg give Marlene anything else?" he asked. "I believe she gave her a scarf or something. Well, one she hadn't no more use for." A showy sort of thing, but not much quality. Or、oh, I know quality when I see it," said Mrs. Tucker, nodding her head. "Used to work at Nas House as a girl, I did. Proper stuff the ladies wore in those days. No gaudy colours and all this nylon and rayon. No real good silk. Why, some of their taffeta dresses would have stood up by themselves." <coughs> Girls like a bit of finery," said Mr. Tucker indulgently. "I don't mind a few bright colours myself, but..." I won't have this here mucky lipstick. That's a bit sharp. I was with her," said Mrs. Tucker, her eyes suddenly misty, "and her gone in that terrible way. Wished afterwards I hadn't spoken so sharp. Ah,、oh, well, not but trouble and funerals lately, it seems. Troubles never come singly, so they say, and that's true enough.、Eh? You have had other losses?" inquired Poirot politely. Ah,、uh, yeah, well, the wife's father," explained Mr. Tucker. Come across the ferry in his boat from the Three Dogs late at night, and must have missed his footing getting down to the quay and fallen in the river. Of course, he ought to have stayed quiet at home at his age, but there you can't do anything with the old uns. Always putting her about on the quay was. But father was a great one for the boats always," said Mrs. Tucker. "Used to look after him in the old days with Mr. Folliot years and years ago. That was not," she added brightly, "as far as much loss as you might say." Well, over ninety he was, and trying in many of his ways, always babbling some nonsense or other. <laughs> But it was time he went. But of course, I had to bury him nice, and two funerals running. Wow,、well, costs a lot of money. 
These economic reflections passed Poirot by. A faint remembrance was stirring. An old man on the quay. That I remember talking to him. What was his name?、Uh, Murdell, sir. That was my name before I married. Now your father, if I remember rightly, was Ed Gardner at Nas. Uh, no, no, that was no. That was my eldest brother. I was the youngest of the family. Eleven of us there were. She added with some pride. There's been Murdells at Nas for years, but they're all scattered now. Father was the last of us. Poirot said softly, "There'll always be Folliots at Nas House." I beg your pardon, sir. No, I am repeating what your old father said to me on the quay. Ah, <laughs> well, talked a lot of nonsense. Father did. I had to shut him up pretty sharp now and then. So Marlene was Madel's granddaughter,、eh? said Poirot. Yes, I begin to see. He was silent for a moment. An immense excitement was surging within him. Your father was drowned, you say, in the river? Ah,、uh, yes, sir.、Uh, took a drop too much, he did. <laughs> And where, where, where he got the money from, I don't know. Of course, he used to get tips now and again on the quay, helping people with the boats or parking with their cars. Very cunning he was at hiding his money from me. Yes, I'm afraid as he had a drop too much, missed his footing, I'd say, getting off his boat onto the quay. So he fell in and was drowned. His body was washed up down at Elmuth next day. It was a wonder, as you might say, that it never happened before him being ninety-two and half blinded anyway. Yeah, but the fact remains that it did not happen before. Ah,、oh, well, accidents happen sooner or later. Accident,、mm, mused Poirot. I wonder. He got up. He murmured, "I should have guessed, guessed long ago. The child practically told me." I beg your pardon, sir. Oh, it is nothing," said Poirot. Oh, uh, once more, I tender you my condolences, both on the death of your daughter and on that of your father. He shook hands with them both and left the cottage. He said to himself, "I have been foolish, very foolish. I have looked at everything the wrong way round." Hi, Mister. It was a cautious whisper. Poirot looked round. The fat child Marilyn was standing in the shadow of the cottage wall. She beckoned him to her and spoke in a whisper. Mum don't know everything," she said. "Marlene didn't get that scarf off the lady down at the cottage. Oh, where did she get it? Bought it in Turkey. Bought some lipstick too and some scent. Newt in Paris. <laughs> Funny name. <laughs> and a jar of foundation cream. What she read about in an advertisement. Marilyn giggled. <laughs> Mum doesn't know. <laughs> Hid it at the back of her drawer. Marlene did under her winter vests. Used to go into the convenience at the bus stop and do herself up when she went to the pictures. Marilyn giggled again. <laughs> Mum never knew. <laughs>、uh, didn't your mother find these things after your sister died? Marilyn shook her fair fluffy head. No, she said. I got them now, in my drawer. Mum doesn't know. Poirot eyed her consideringly and said, "You seem a very clever girl, Marilyn." Marilyn grinned rather sheepishly. Miss Bird says it's no good my trying for the grammar school. Oh, the grammar school is not everything," said Poirot. "Tell me, how did Marlene get the money to buy these things, eh?" Marilyn looked with close attention at a drain pipe. "Don't know," she muttered. I think you do know," said Poirot. Shamelessly, he drew out a half a crown from his pocket and added another half crown to it. "I believe," he said, "there is a new, very attractive shade of lipstick called Carmine Kiss."、Mm-hmm. "Oh, sounds smashing!" said Marilyn. Her hand advanced towards the five shillings. She spoke in a rapid whisper. Well, she used to snoop about a bit. Marlene did. Used to see you know, goings on. <laughs> you know what?、Um, well, Marlene would promise not to tell, and then they'd give her a present. See? Poirot relinquished the five shillings. I see," he said. He nodded to Marlene and walked away. He murmured again under his breath, but this time with intensified meaning. I see. 
So many things now fell into place. Not all of it, not clear yet by any means, but he was on the right track. A perfectly clear trail all the way, if only he had had the wit to see it. That first conversation with Mrs. Oliver, some casual words of Michael Wayman's, the significant conversation with old Murdell on the quay, an illuminating phrase spoken by Miss Brewis, the arrival of Etienne de Souza. A public telephone box stood adjacent to the village post office. He entered it and rang up a number. A few minutes later, he was speaking to Inspector Bland. Well, Monsieur Poirot, where are you? I am here, in Nescom. But you were in London yesterday afternoon. Why don't it take three and a half hours to come here by a good train? Poirot pointed out. I have a question for you. Yes. What kind of a yacht did Etienne de Souza have? Ah, well, maybe I can guess what you're thinking, Monsieur Poirot, but I assure you <laughs> there was nothing of that kind. It wasn't fitted up for smuggling, if that's what you mean. There were no fancy hidden partitions or secret cubbyholes. We'd have found them if there had been. There was nowhere on it you could have stowed away a body. Ah, you are wrong, mon cher. That is not what I mean. I only asked what kind of a yacht, eh? Big or small? Oh, well, it was very fancy. Must have cast the earth. All very smart. Newly painted, luxury fittings. Exactly, said Poirot. He sounded so pleased that Inspector Bland felt quite surprised. Well, what are you getting at, Monsieur Poirot? He asked. Etienne de Souza, said Poirot, is a rich man. That, my friend, is very significant. Why? demanded Inspector Bland. It fits in with my latest idea, said Poirot. Oh, you've got an idea then? Yes, at last I have an idea. Up to now I have been very stupid. You mean we've all been very stupid? Oh no, no," said Poirot. "I mean especially myself. I had the good fortune to have a perfectly clear trail presented to me, and I did not see it. But now you're definitely onto something. I think so. Yes. Look here, Monsieur Poirot. I... But Poirot had rung off. After searching his pockets for available change. He put through a personal call to Mrs. Oliver at her London number. Oh, but do not! He hastened to add when he made his demand. Disturb the lady to answer the telephone if she is at work. He remembered how bitterly Mrs. Oliver had once reproached him for interrupting a train of creative thought, and how the world, in consequence, had been deprived of an intriguing mystery centering around an old-fashioned, long-sleeved woolen vest. The exchange, however, was unable to appreciate his scruples. Well. It demanded, "You want a personal caller, don't you?" "I do," said Poirot, sacrificing Mrs. Oliver's creative genius upon the altar of his own impatience. He was relieved when Mrs. Oliver spoke. She interrupted his apologies. "Oh, it's splendid that you've rung me up," she said. "I was just going out to give a talk on how I write my books. Now I can get my secretary to ring up and say I'm unavoidably detained." Oh, but Madame, you must not let me prevent you. No,、oh, it's not a case of preventing," said Mrs. Oliver joyfully. "I'd have made the most awful fool of myself. I mean, what can you say about how you write books? Oh, what I mean is, first you've got to think of something, and when you've thought of it, you've got to force yourself to sit down and write it. That's all. It would have taken me just three minutes to explain that, and then the talk would have been ended, and everyone would have been very fed up." I can't imagine why everybody is always so keen for authors to talk about writing. I should have thought it was an author's business to write, not talk. And yet, it is about how you write that I want to ask you.、Eh? Well, you can ask," said Mrs. Oliver, "but I probably shan't know the answer. I mean, one just sits down and writes. Now, now, half a minute. I've got a frightfully silly hat on for the talk, and I must take it off. It scratches my forehead." There was a momentary pause, and then the voice of Mrs. Oliver resumed in a relieved voice. Hats are really only a symbol nowadays, aren't they? I mean, one doesn't wear them for sensible reasons any more—、um, to keep one's head warm, or to shield one from the sun, or to hide one's face from people one doesn't want to meet. <laughs> oh, but I beg your pardon, Monsieur Poirot. Did you say something? Oh no, it was an ejaculation only. It is extraordinary," said Poirot, and his voice was awed. Always you give me ideas. So also did my friend these things, whom I have not seen for many, oh, many years. You have given me now the clue to yet another piece of my problem, but no more of all that. Let me ask you instead my question: 
Do you know an atom scientist, madame? Do I know an atom scientist? said Mrs. Oliver in a surprised voice. Well, I don't know. I suppose I may. I mean, I, I know some professors and things. I'm never quite sure what they actually do. Yet you made an atom scientist one of the suspects in your murder aunt, eh? Oh, that! Well, that was just to be up to date. I mean, when I went to buy presents for my nephews last Christmas, there was nothing but science fiction and the stratosphere and supersonic toys, and so I thought, when I started on the murder hunt, well, better to have an atom scientist as the chief suspect and be modern. After all, if I'd needed a little technical jargon for it, I could always have got it from Alec Legg. Alec Legg? The husband of Sally Legg? Is he an atom scientist? Oh, yes, he is. Not Harwell. Wales somewhere, Cardiff, or Bristol, is it? Well, it's, it's just a holiday cottage they have on the helm. Yes, so, of course, I do know an atom scientist after all. And it was meeting him at Nass House that probably put the idea of an atom scientist into your head. But his wife is not Yugoslavian? Oh, no, said Mrs. Oliver. Sally is English as English. Surely you realize that. Then what put the idea of the Yugoslavian wife into your head? I really don't know. Refugees, perhaps? Students? All those foreign girls at the hostel trespassing through the woods and speaking broken English. I see. Yes, I see now a lot of things. But it's about time, said Mrs. Oliver. Uh, pardon? I said it was about time, said Mrs. Oliver, that you did see things, I mean. Up to now, you don't seem to have done anything. Her voice held reproach. Well, one cannot arrive at things all in a moment, said Poirot, defending himself. The police, he added, have been completely baffled. Oh, the police, said Mrs. Oliver. Now, if a woman with the head of Scotland Yard... Recognising this well-known phrase, Poirot hastened to interrupt. Well, the matter has been complex, he said, extremely complex. But now, I tell you this in confidence... But now I arrive. Mrs. Oliver remained unimpressed. I dare say, she said. But in the meantime, there have been two murders. Three, Poirot corrected her. Three murders? Who's the third? An old man called Murdell, said Hercule Poirot. Well, I haven't heard of that one, said Mrs. Oliver. Will it be in the paper? Oh, no, said Poirot. Up to now, no one has suspected that it was anything but an accident. Then it wasn't an accident? No, said Poirot. It was not an accident. Well, tell me who did it. Uh, did them, I mean. Or can't you over the telephone? One does not say these things over the telephone, said Poirot. Well, then I shall ring off, said Mrs. Oliver. I can't bear it. No, oh, wait a moment, said Poirot. There is something else I wanted to ask you. Ah, uh, now, uh, oh, what was it? Oh, that's a sign of age, said Mrs. Oliver. I do that too, forget things. No, 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 but there was something, some little point. It it worried me. Uh, I was in the boathouse. Uh, he cast his mind back. That pile of comics. Marlene's phrases scrawled on the margin. Albert goes with Doreen. He had had a feeling that there was something lacking, that there was something he must ask Mrs. Oliver. Are you still there, Monsieur Poirot? demanded Mrs. Oliver. At the same time, the operator requested more money. These formalities completed, Poirot spoke once more. Are you still there, madame? I'm still here, said Mrs. Oliver. And don't let's waste any more money asking each other if we're there. What is it? It is something very important. You remember your mother, aunt? Well, of course I remember it. It's practically what we've just been talking about, isn't it? Well, I made one grave mistake, said Poirot. I never read your synopsis for competitors. In the gravity of discovering a murder, it did not seem to matter. <laughs> but I was wrong. It did matter. Now, you are a sensitive person, madame. You are affected by your atmosphere, by the personalities of the people you meet. And these are translated into your work. Not recognizably so, but they are the inspiration from which your fertile brain draws its creations. Well, that's very nice flowery language, said Mrs. Oliver. But um, what exactly do you mean? That you have always known more about this crime than you have realized yourself. Now, for the question I want to ask you, two questions, actually. 
But the first is very important. Did you, when you first began to plan your murder hunt, mean the body to be discovered in the boathouse? No, I didn't. Where did you intend it to be? Well, in that funny little summer house tucked away in the rhododendrons near the house. I thought it was just the place. But then someone, uh, well, I can't remember who exactly, began insisting that it should be found in the folly. Well, that, of course, was an absurd idea. I mean, anyone could have strolled in there quite casually and come across it without having followed a single clue. People are so stupid. Of course I couldn't agree to that. So, instead, you accepted the boathouse? Yes, that's just how it happened. There was really nothing against the boathouse, though I still thought the little summer house would have been better. Oh, yes. That is the technique you outlined to me that first day. Now, there is one thing more. Do you remember telling me that there was a final clue written on one of the comics that Marlene was given to amuse her? Yes, of course. Tell me, was it something like... He forced his memory back to a moment when he had stood reading various scrawled phrases. Albert goes with Doreen? Or jean Poggi kisses hackers in the wood? Peter pinches girls in the cinema? Oh, good gracious me, no! said Mrs. Oliver in a slightly shocked voice. It wasn't anything silly like that. No, mine was a perfectly straightforward clue. She lowered her voice and spoke in mysterious tones. Look in the hiker's rucksack. Et patent, cried Poirot. Et patent? Of course, the comic with that on it would have to be taken away. It might have given someone ideas. The rucksack, of course, was on the floor by the body. And, ah, but it is another rucksack of which I am thinking. Yeah, now, you're confusing me with all these rucksacks, Mrs. Oliver complained. There was only one in my murder story. Don't you want to know what was in it? Not in the least, said Poirot. Well, that is to say, he added politely, I should be enchanted to hear, of course, but... Uh, Mrs. Oliver swept over the butt. Well, very ingenious, I think, she said, the pride of authorship in her voice. You see, in Marlene's haversack, which was supposed to be the Yugoslavian wife's haversack, if you understand what I mean, there was... A yes, 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 said Poirot, preparing himself to be lost in fog once more. Well, in it was the bottle of medicine containing poison with which the country squire poisoned his wife. You see... The Yugoslavian girl had been over here training as a nurse, and she'd been in the house when Colonel Blunt poisoned his first wife for her money. And she, well, the nurse, had got hold of the bottle and taken it away, and then come back to blackmail him. Well, now, that, of course, is why he killed her. Now, does that fit in, Monsieur Poirot? Uh, fit in with what? Uh, fit in, well, f with your ideas, said Mrs. Oliver. Uh, not at all, said Poirot but added hastily, All the same, my felicitations, madame. I am sure your murder aunt was so ingenious that nobody won the prize, eh? Oh, but they did, said Mrs. Oliver. Quite late, about seven o'clock. A very dogged old lady, supposed to be quite gaga, she got through all the clues and arrived at the boathouse triumphantly, but of course the police were there. So then she heard about the murder. And she was the last person of the whole fate to hear about it, I should imagine. Anyway, they gave her the prize, she added with satisfaction. That horrid young man with the freckles who said I drank like a fish never got farther than the camellia garden. Oh, well, some day, madame, said Poirot, you shall tell me this story of yours. Actually, said Mrs. Oliver, I'm thinking of turning it into a book. It would be a pity to waste it. And it may here be mentioned that some three years later, Hercule Poirot read The Woman in the Wood by Ariadne Oliver, and wondered whilst he read it why some of the persons and incidents seemed to him vaguely familiar. Chapter 18 The sun was setting when Poirot came to what was called officially Mill Cottage, and known locally as the Pink Cottage down by Lauder's Creek. He knocked on the door, and it was flung open with such suddenness that he started back. The angry-looking young man in the doorway stared at him for a moment without recognising him. Then he gave a short laugh. <laughs> hello, he said. It's the sleuth. Come in, Monsieur Poirot, I'm packing up. Poirot accepted the invitation and stepped into the cottage. It was plainly rather badly furnished. 
and Alec Legg's personal possessions were at the moment taking up a disproportionate amount of room. Books, papers, and articles of stray clothing were strewn all around. An open suitcase stood on the floor. The final break-up of the menage, said Alec Legg. Sally's cleared out. I expect you know that. I did not know it, no. Alec Legg gave a short laugh. <laughs> well, I'm glad there's something you don't know. Yes, she's had enough of married life. Going to link up her life with a tame architect. I am sorry to hear it, said Poirot. Well, I don't see why you should be sorry. I am sorry, said Poirot, clearing off two books and a shirt and sitting down on the corner of the sofa. Because I do not think she will be as happy with him as she would be with you. Well, she hasn't been particularly happy with me this last six months. Oh, six months is not a lifetime, said Poirot. It is a very short space out of what might be a long, happy, married life. Talking rather like a parson, aren't you? Oh, possibly. Well, may I say, Monsieur Legg, that if your wife has not been happy with you, it is probably more your fault than hers. Well, she certainly thinks so. Everything's my fault, I suppose. Oh, not everything, but some things. Oh, blame everything on me. I might as well drown myself in the damn river and have done with it, then. Poirot looked at him thoughtfully. I am glad to observe, he remarked, that you are now more perturbed with your own troubles than with those of the world. <laughs> well, the world can go hang, said Mr. Legg. He added bitterly, I seem to have made the most complete fool of myself all along the line. Yes, said Poirot. I would say that you have been more unfortunate and reprehensible in your conduct. Alec Legg stared at him. Who hired you to sleuth me? he demanded. Was it Sally? Now, why should you think that? Well, I mean, nothing's happened officially, so I concluded that you must have come down after me on a private job. Ah, you are in error, replied Poirot. I have not at any time been sleuthing you. When I came down here, I had no idea that you existed. Well, then how do you know whether I've been unfortunate or made a fool of myself or what? From the result of observation and reflection, said Poirot. Shall I make a little guess, and will you tell me if I'm right? Well, you can make as many little guesses as you like, said Alec Legg, but don't expect me to play. I think, said Poirot, that some years ago you had an interest and sympathy for a certain political party, like many other young men of scientific bent. Eh? In your profession, such sympathies and tendencies are naturally regarded with suspicion. I do not think you are ever seriously compromised, but I do think that pressure was brought upon you to consolidate your position in a way you did not want to consolidate it. You tried to withdraw, and you were faced with a threat. You were given a rendezvous with someone. I doubt if I shall ever know that young man's name. He will be for me always the young man in a turtle shirt. Alec Legg gave a sudden explosion of laughter. <laughs> well, I suppose that shirt was a bit of a joke. I wasn't seeing things very funny, though, at the time. Hercule Poirot continued. And what with worry over the fate of the world and the worry over your own predicament, you became, if I may say so, a man almost impossible for any woman to live with happily. You did not confide in your wife. That was unfortunate for you, as I should say that your wife was a woman of loyalty, and that if she had realized how unhappy or desperate you were, she would have been wholeheartedly on your side. Instead of that, she merely began to compare you unfavorably with a former friend of hers, Michael Wayman. He rose. I should advise you, Monsieur Legg, to complete your packing as soon as possible, to follow your wife to London, to ask her to forgive you, and to tell her all that you have been through. So that's what you advise, said Alec Legg. And what the hell business is it of yours? None, said Hercule Poirot. He withdrew towards the door. But I am always right. There was a moment's silence. Then Alec Legg burst into a wild peal of laughter. <laughs> Do you know, he said, I think I'll take your advice. Oh, well, divorce is damned expensive. Anyway, 
If you've got hold of the woman you want... If you enjoyed this audio and her, the value and effort that we you bring you these audios... I of shall go up to her flat in Chelsea. Why not buy and if I find Michael there, coffee, look I shall take hold of him by the, the description pansy tie Make wears, sure you subscribe to this channel so I'd that you will not that. miss another yes. audio. Thank I'd you enjoy for supporting this channel. Deal. It is appreciated. His face suddenly lit up with a most attractive smile. I know, look, I'm sorry for my filthy temper, he said. And uh, thanks a lot. He clapped Poirot on the shoulder. With the force of the blow, Poirot staggered and all but fell. Mr. Legg's friendship was certainly more painful than his animosity. And now, said Poirot, leaving Mill Cottage on painful feet and looking up at the darkening sky, where do I go? Chapter 19 The chief constable and Inspector Bland looked up with keen curiosity as Hercule Poirot was ushered in. The chief constable was not in the best of tempers. Only Bland's quiet persistence had caused him to cancel his dinner appointment for that evening. I know, Bland, I know, he said fretfully. Or maybe he was a little Belgian wizard in his day, but surely, man, his days are over. He's what age? Bland slid tactfully over the answer to this question, which in any case he did not know. Poirot himself was always reticent on the subject of his age. Well, the point is, sir, he was there, on the spot. And we're not getting anywhere any other way. Up against a blank wall. And that's where we are. The chief constable blew his nose irritably. Well, I know, I know. Makes me begin to believe in Mrs. Masterton's homicidal pervert. I'd even use bloodhounds if there were anywhere to use them. Bloodhounds can't follow a scent over water. Yes. I know what you've always thought, Bland, and I'm inclined to agree with you. But there's absolutely no motive, you know. Not an iota of motive. Oh, the motive may be out in the islands. My meaning that Hattie Stubbs knew something about D'Souza out there? Well, I suppose that's reasonably possible, given her mentality. She was simple. Everybody agrees on that. She might blurt out what she knew to anyone at any time. Is that the way you see it? Something like that. If so, he waited a long time before crossing the sea and doing something about it. Well, sir, it's possible he didn't know what exactly had become of her. His own story was that he'd seen a piece in some society periodical about Nass House and its beautiful Chatelaine, uh, which I've always thought myself, added Bland, parenthetically, to be a silver thing with chains and bits and pieces hung on it that people's grandmothers used to clip on their waistbands, and a, oh, and a good idea, too. Wouldn't be all these silly women forever leaving their handbags around. <clears throat> it seems, though, that in women's jargon, Chatelaine means mistress of her house. As I say, that's history, and maybe it's true enough, and he didn't know where she was or who she'd married until then. But once he did know, he came across post-haste in a yacht in order to murder her. It's far-fetched, Bland, very far-fetched. But it could be, sir. Well, what on earth could the woman know? Remember what she said to her husband? He kills people. Well, murder remembered. From the time she was fifteen. And presumably only her word for it. Surely he'd be able to laugh that off. Well, we don't know the facts, said Bland stubbornly. You know yourself, sir, how once one knows who did a thing... One can look for evidence and find it. Mm. Well, we've made inquiries about D'Souza discreetly, through the usual channels, and got nowhere. That's just why, sir, this funny old Belgian boy might have stumbled on something. He was in the house. That's the important thing. Lady Stubbs talked to him. Some of the random things she said may have come together in his mind and made sense. However that may be, he's been down in Nascombe most of today. And he rang you up to ask what kind of a yacht Etienne de Souza had? Well, when he rang up the first time, yes. The second time was to ask me to arrange this meeting. Well, the chief constable looked at his watch. If he doesn't come within five minutes... But it was at that very moment that Hercule Poirot was shown in. His appearance was not as immaculate as usual. His moustache was limp. Affected by the damp debonair, his patent leather shoes were heavily coated with mud. He limped, and his hair was ruffled. Well, so there you are, Monsieur Poirot, the chief constable shook hands. We're all keyed up. 
on our toes, waiting to hear what you have to tell us. Hmm? The words were faintly ironic, but Hercule Poirot, however damp physically, was in no mood to be damped mentally. I cannot imagine, he said, how it was I did not see the truth before. The chief constable received this rather coldly. Are we to understand that you do see the truth now? Oh, yes. Well, there are details, but the outline is clear. We want more than an outline, said the chief constable dryly. We want evidence. Have you got evidence, Monsieur Poirot? Well, I can tell you where to find the evidence. Inspector Bland spoke. Such as? Poirot turned to him and asked a question. Etienne de Souza has, I suppose, left the country? Two weeks ago, Bland added bitterly. It won't be easy to get him back. Oh, he might be persuaded. Persuaded? There's not sufficient evidence to warrant an extradition order, then. It is not a question of an extradition order. If the facts are put to him... But what facts, Monsieur Poirot? The chief constable spoke with some irritation. What are these facts you talk about so glibly? The fact that Etienne de Souza came here in a lavishly appointed luxury yacht, showing that his family is rich. The fact that old Murdell was Marlene Tucker's grandfather, which I had not known until today. The fact that Lady Stubbs was fond of wearing the coolie type of hat. The fact that Mrs. Oliver, in spite of an unbridled and unreliable imagination, is, unrealized by herself, a very shrewd judge of character. The fact that Marlene Tucker had lipsticks and bottles of perfume hidden at the back of her bureau drawer. The fact that Miss Bruce maintains that it was Lady Stubbs who asked her to take a refreshment tray down to Marlene at the boathouse. Facts. The chief constable stared. You call those facts? But there's nothing new there. You prefer evidence, sir? Huh? Definite evidence, eh? such as Lady Stubbs' body? Now it was Bland who stared. You have found Lady Stubbs' body? Oh, not actually found it, but I know where it is hidden. You shall go to this spot, and when you have found it, then? Then you will have evidence, all the evidence you need. For only one person could have hidden it there. And who's that? Hercule Poirot smiled, the contented smile of a cat who has lapped up a saucer of cream. The person it so often is, he said softly. The husband? <laughs> Sir George Stubbs killed his wife. But that's impossible, Monsieur Poirot. We know it's impossible. Oh, no, said Poirot. It is not impossible at all. Listen, and I will tell you. Chapter 20 Hercule Poirot paused a moment at the big wrought-iron gates. He looked ahead of him along the curving drive. The last of the golden brown leaves fluttered down from the trees. The cyclamen were over. Poirot sighed. He turned aside and rapped gently on the door of the little white pilastered lodge. After a few moments' delay, he heard footsteps inside, those slow, hesitant footsteps. The door was opened by Mrs. Folliat. He was not startled this time to see how old and frail she looked. She said, Oh, Monsieur Poirot, you again? <laughs> May I come in? Of course. He followed her in. She offered him tea, which he refused. Then she asked in a quiet voice, Why have you come? I think you can guess, madame. Her answer was oblique. I'm very tired, she said. I know. He went on. There have now been three deaths. At East Stubbs, Marlene Tucker, old Murdell. She said sharply, Murdell? There was an accident. He fell from the quay. He was very old, half blind, and he'd been drinking in the pub. No, it was not an accident, no. Huh? Madel knew too much. What did he know? He recognized a face, or a way of walking, or a voice, something like that, eh? I talked to him the day I first came down here. He told me then all about the Folliette family, about your father-in-law, and your husband, and your sons who were killed in the war. 
Only they were not both killed, were they? Hmm? Your son Henry went down with his ship, but your second son, James, was not killed. He deserted. He was reported at first perhaps missing, believed, killed. And later you told everyone that he was killed. It was nobody's business to disbelieve that statement. <laughs> Why should they? Poirot paused and then went on. Do not imagine I have no sympathy for you, madame. Life has been hard for you, I know. You can have had no real illusions about your younger son, but he was your son and you loved him. You did all you could to give him a new life. You had the charge of a young girl, a subnormal but very rich girl. Oh, yes, she was rich. You gave out that her parents had lost all their money, that she was poor, and that you had advised her to marry a rich man many years older than herself. Why should anybody disbelieve your story? <laughs> Again, it was nobody's business. Her parents and near relatives had been killed. A firm of French lawyers in Paris acted as instructed by lawyers in San Miguel. On her marriage, she assumed control of her own fortune. She was, as you have told me, docile, affectionate, suggestible. Everything her husband asked her to sign, she signed. Securities were probably changed and resold many times. But in the end, the desired financial result was reached. Sir George Stubbs, the new personality assumed by your son, became a rich man, and his wife became... A pauper. No, it is no legal offence to call yourself sir, unless it is done to obtain money under false pretenses. A title creates confidence. It suggests, if not birth, then certainly riches. So, the rich, Sir George Stubbs, older and changed in appearance and having grown a beard, bought Nass House and came to live where he belonged, though he had not been there since he was a boy. There was nobody left after the devastation of the war who was likely to have recognized him, but old Murdell did. He kept the knowledge to himself, but when he said to me slyly that there would always be foliots at Nass House, eh? that was his own private joke. So all had turned out well, or so you thought. Your plan, I fully believe, stopped there. Your son had wealth, his ancestral home... And though his wife was subnormal, she was a beautiful and docile girl, and you hoped he would be kind to her and that she would be happy. Mrs. Folliot said in a low voice, Well, yes, that's how I thought it would be. I would look after Hattie and care for her. I never dreamed. You never dreamed. And your son carefully did not tell you that at the time of the marriage he was already married. <laughs> oh, yes. We have searched the records for what we knew must exist. Your son had married a girl in Trieste, a girl of the underground criminal world with whom he concealed himself after his desertion. She had no mind to be parted from him, nor for that matter had he any intention of being parted from her. He accepted the marriage with Hattie as a means to wealth, but in his own mind he knew from the beginning what he intended to do. No, no, I, I, I do not believe that. I cannot believe it. It was that woman, that wicked creature. Poirot went on inexorably. He meant murder. Hattie had no relations, few friends. Immediately on their return to England, he brought her here. The servants hardly saw her that first evening. And the woman they saw the next morning was not Hattie, but his Italian wife, made up as Hattie, and behaving roughly much as Hattie behaved. And there again it might have ended. The false Hattie would have lived out her life as a real Hattie, though doubtless her mental powers would have unexpectedly improved owing to what would vaguely be called new treatment. The secretary, Miss Brewis, already realized that there was very little wrong with Lady Stubbs' mental processes. But then a totally unforeseen thing happened. A cousin of Hattie's wrote that he was coming to England on a yachting trip, and although that cousin had not seen her for many years, he would not be likely to be deceived by an impostor. It is odd, said Poirot, breaking off his narrative, that though the thought did cross my mind that the Sousa might not be the Sousa, it never occurred to me that the truth lay the other way round. That is to say, that Hattie, 
was not happy. He went on. There might have been several different ways of meeting that situation. Lady Stubbs could have avoided a meeting with a plea of illness, but if the Souza remained long in England, she could hardly have continued to avoid meeting him. And there was already another complication. Old Merdell, garrulous in his old age, used to chatter to his granddaughter. She was probably the only person who bothered to listen to him, and even she dismissed most of what he said because she thought him batty. Nevertheless, some of the things he said about having seen a woman's body in the woods and Sir George Stubbs being really Mr. James made sufficient impression on her to make her hint about them tentatively to Sir George. In doing so, of course, she signed her own death warrant. Sir George and his wife could take no chances of stories like that getting around. I imagine he handed her out small sums of hush money and proceeded to make his plans. They worked out their scheme very carefully. Hmm? They already knew the date when de Souza was due at Hellmouth. It coincided with the date fixed for the fate. They arranged their plan so that Marlene should be killed and Lady Stubbs disappear in conditions which should throw vague suspicion on de Souza. Hence the reference to his being a wicked man, and the accusation he kills people. Lady Stubbs was to disappear permanently. Possibly a conveniently unrecognizable body might be identified at some time by Sir George, and a new personality was to take her place. Actually, Hattie would merely resume her own Italian personality, all that was needed was for her to double the parts over a period of a little more than twenty-four hours. With the connivance of Sir George, this was easy. On the day I arrived, Lady Stubbs was supposed to have remained in her room until just before tea time. Nobody saw her there except Sir George. Actually, she slipped out, took a bus or a train to Exeter, and travelled from Exeter in the company of another girl student well, several travel every day this time of year, to whom she confided her story of the friend who had eaten bad veal and ham pie. She arrives at the hostel, books her cubicle, and goes out to explore. By tea time, Lady Stubbs is in the drawing room. After dinner, Lady Stubbs goes early to bed. But, Miss Bruce caught a glimpse of her slipping out of the house a short while afterwards. She spends the night in the hostel, but is out early, and is back at Nass as Lady Stubbs for breakfast. Again, she spends a morning in her room with a headache, and this time manages to stage an appearance as a trespasser. Rebuffed by Sir George from the window of his wife's room, where he pretends to turn and speak to his wife inside that room. The changes of costume were not difficult. Shorts and an open shirt under one of the elaborate dresses that Lady Stubbs was fond of wearing. Heavy white makeup for Lady Stubbs with a big coolie hat to shade her face. A gay peasant scarf, sunburned complexion and bronze red curls for the Italian girl. No one would have dreamed that those two were the same woman. And so the final drama was staged. Just before four o'clock, Lady Stubbs told Miss Brois to take a tea tray down to Marlene. That was because she was afraid such an idea might occur to Miss Brois independently, huh? and it would be fatal if Miss Brois should inconveniently appear at the wrong moment. Perhaps, too, she had a malicious pleasure in arranging for Miss Brois to be at the scene of the crime at approximately the time when it was committed. Then, choosing her moment, she slipped into the empty fortune-telling tent, out through the back and into the summer house in the shrubbery where she kept her hiker's rucksack with its change of costume. Huh? She slipped through the woods, called to Marlene to let her in, and strangled the unsuspecting girl then and there. The big coolie hat she threw into the river. Then she changed into her hiker dress and makeup, 
packaged up her cyclamen gorget dress and high heel shoes in the rucksack, and presently an Italian student from the youth hostel joined her Dutch acquaintance at the shows on the lawn, and left with her by the local bus as planned. Hmm. Where she is now, I do not know. I suspect in Soho, where she doubtless has underworld affiliations of her own nationality, who can provide her with the necessary papers. In any case, it is not for an Italian girl that the police are looking. It is for Hattie Stops. Simple, subnormal, exotic. But poor Hattie Stubbs is dead. As you yourself, madame, know only too well, you revealed that knowledge when I spoke to you in the drawing room on the day of the fete. The death of Marlene had been a bad shock to you. You had not had the least idea of what was planned, but you revealed very clearly, though I was dense enough not to see it at the time, that when you talked of Hattie, you were talking of two different people. One, a woman you disliked, who would be better dead, and against whom you warned me not to believe a word she said. The other, a girl of whom you spoke in the past tense, and whom you defended with a warm affection. I think, madame, that you were very fond of poor Hattie Stubbs. There was a long pause. Mrs. Folliat sat quite still in her chair. At last she roused herself and spoke. Her voice had the coldness of ice. Your whole story is quite fantastic, Monsieur Poirot. I really think you must be mad. All this is entirely in your head. You have no evidence whatsoever. Poirot went across to one of the windows and opened it. Listen, madame, what do you hear? I am a little deaf. What should I hear? The blows of a pickaxe. They are breaking up the concrete foundation of the folly. What a good place to bury a body, huh? Where a tree has been uprooted and the earth is already disturbed. A little later, to make all safe, concrete over the ground where the body lies and on the concrete erect a folly. He added gently, Sir George's folly, the folly of the owner of Nass House. A long, shuddering sigh escaped Mrs. Folliot. <gasps> Such a beautiful place, said Poirot. Only one thing evil, huh? the man who owns it. Mm -hmm. I know. Her words came hoarsely. I have always known. Even as a child, he frightened me. Ruthless, without pity and without conscience. But he was my son, and I loved him. Oh, I should have spoken out after Hattie's death, I know, but he was my son. How could I be the one to give him up? And so, because of my silence, that poor, silly child was killed. And after her... Dear old Murdell, where would it have ended? Oh, with a murderer, it does not end, said Poirot. She bowed her head. For a moment or two she stayed so, her hands covering her eyes. Then Mrs. Folliat of Nass House, daughter of a long line of brave men, drew herself erect. She looked straight at Poirot, and her voice was formal and remote. Thank you, Monsieur Poirot, she said, for coming to tell me yourself of this. Will you leave me now? There are some things that one has to face quite alone.
If you enjoyed this audio and the value and effort that we bring you these audios of world-class authors, then why not buy us a cup of coffee? Look for the link below in the description area. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so that you will not miss another audio. Thank you for supporting this channel. It is appreciated.